So damaged DNA must be repaired if the damage is passed on to subsequent generations. Uh, so we know that uh, in our body there is consequent damages are also happening in our, our DNA so which lead to some diseases but we also have DNA repair system which eventually repairing our uh, DNA to have a smooth functioning of our body whether it's a brain, a liver, stomach, lungs, um, intestines, our nervous system, circulatory system whichever the system is there's always some uh, haphazard are happening but side by side the repair system is also working so this is everything <coughs> <coughs> So everything is working simultaneously. So in order to maintain that, um, our body is working. So, so whatever the damaged DNA is there, it should be repaired. If it is keep going on, passing to the generation, then we will have a evolutionary term here, mutation. That things will be um, changed in our next generations. So these mutations must be taking place in the germ cells, that is eggs and sperms. But if the damage uh, is in the somatic cells, then this will be not affected towards the next generation. Damage from where is possible? Uh, because of some, during the DNA replication, some errors could happen uh, due to some chemical agents acting on the DNA, UV light imparting energy into the DNA molecule, spontaneous changes to the DNA. So all these four uh, reasons could be the reason behind the damaged DNA. So why we need to repair this DNA? Uh, as we know, there is a DNA polymerase was helping to for the DNA replication and was doing good job, but it's not good enough. So it could produce some errors, one uh, in 10 raised to power 7 nucleotides added, uh, which it does not correct. So other mechanism also are there present, which correct many of the errors left by the replication system. So most mistakes and damage are corrected, 99% uh, leaving just a few like 1 into 10 is power error and left. So mutations are permanent changes left in the DNA. So if there are 10 is to power 7 amount of nucleotides are produced, yeah, then out of them one would be the error in them. And that is a lot, a single error is a lot. Then why repair DNA system? So repair of non-replication related damage to the DNA must also be priority for the cells. So these defects also will represent translation and duplication of the DNA. The so cell will die. So again, any error or changes to the DNA becomes mutation and which are permanent and could not be changed afterwards in the DNA. For example, sickle cell disease. This is a very good illustration of devastating effects of tiny changes to DNA within the R RBCs. So our hemoglobin has a large protein component which has two beta globin chains and it has single base chain substitution causing the disease. So this is the single standard of normal beta globin gene. So like this. So from your adenine, your, it transfer to the thymine. So uh, single nucleotide chain mutations from A to T. So what is happening is the sickle cell, the red blood cells which are in concave shape like this donut shape, they are changing into this sickle cell shape. So they might not function as good as they were in this shape. So they will not uh, work as good as they was before. So this is, that's why we have this sickle cell disease. The person then cannot heal their bones. So it's very bad then. Then spontaneous mutations which involves the thermal energy due to random uh, collisions between molecules and DNA in the cell. Uh, which cannot be prevented and parts of DNA molecules are stripped off and alteration introduced. So this could have many many outcomes uh, which cannot be repaired. Then there is a direct DNA damage, that is some agents uh, damage DNA directly, for example chemicals and lights. So chemicals such as alkylating agents uh, which helps to remove your alkyl group like methyl and ethyl groups added to the DNAs. So this type of uh, damage can be repaired by reversing the reactions with special enzymes. So they remove the offending atoms and restore the base at the end. 
then beyond that there are also some um, reversible chemical changes are possible for like uh, the chemical DNA damage done by UV light so UV light uh, is able to produce dimers so two thymine, uh, thymine dimers that are present over the nucleotides on, on, on top of each other they could make a dimer itself then your base is nitrogen base could be methylation could happen methyl group could be added or ethyl group could be added thylation or very big groups are added to the nitrogen base so most other damage requires other systems then so this is the example here so with the UV light induced aberrant bonding between neighboring pyrimidines your thymine and cytosine bases on the strand, uh, same strand of DNA so this will prevent the replication machine from duplicating the DNA and the cell will die so this is your um, phosphate sugar phosphate this is thymine this is thymine so if there is a UV light is there so they, they make uh, this dimer formation one carbon will make uh, with another one, another carbon will make with another carbon so this type of defects can readily be reversed by the process called photo reactivation so visible light energy is used to reverse the defect uh, in bacteria yeast protease some plants and some animals but not in humans so other forms of DNA damage are like deamination so an amino group of cytosine is removed and the base becomes uracil yeah then another is a form of DNA damage is an amino group of adenine is removed and the base becomes hypoxanthin then amino group of guanine is removed and the base become hypoxanthin so this is the DNA damage because of the uh, cytosine is removed and the base becomes uracil and amino group of adenine is removed and the base becomes hypoxanthin and also there is a deep urination in the deep urination the base is simply ripped out of the DNA molecule and leaving a gap like a missing group and there is a molecular level view remembering these are the random events so you have a deep urination and deamination and in the deep urination uh, we can say that uh, you have a phosphate and sugar group which has guanine yeah and also with the help we, we add uh, one water group to that because of addition of uh, water group your guanine is removed yeah so it's become a deep urinated water that is purine group is removed completely another case in the second point of view from the molecular level view you have this, this cytosine added yeah the cytosine is then with the help of uh, water we added a amino group to that and by the change of uh, amino group so it what will amino group will be removed so it will add oxygen group so it will change this cytosine into uracil so we remove the amine group into that then that means it's a deamination so here students this is cut it off this is cut it off and o group is added and this is a without guanine group so that's the difference between your deep urination and deamination and in the previous case this was the these two were making a disulfide bonds oh sorry uh, carbon and carbon making double bonds thymine dimer it's known as another perspective um, same two events as the last slide that what we have seen here this deep urination and deamination so how it is happening in the cell so in the deaminated cells that is the uracil is converting into the cytosine so this is the u and g's are added so this is deaminated uh, cytosine so from the cytosine this NH3 is group proved and then they went for DNA replication so it will produce G as C but a G has been changed into an A so this is further uh, some changes will happen so once your U is changed and then in, instead of uh, G here it will produce your 
A. According to you, they will make a A here. Because A and U are the together. And in this case, it will remain unchanged. So it will change from U will change to C. So this will be fine one. Another case in the deep urinated, if you are having deep urinated A, there is no purine group here. So T uh, is lying there. One thing could happen. Um, T and A will replace this. So it will remove this T, kick out. Or another case, A could come on top there. So, so these two events could happen, two uh, events after the last slide that has happened. So first, deep urination is done. What will happen next? Once the deamination is done, what will happen next? So these two circumstances are possible. So which is which? The cell has a big problem to overcome. So how does it tell which strand carried the correct information? So in order to so, so we having this cell has a mechanism of identifying new strand synthesis, leaving the next that the DNA. Next are the one, uh, which are the gaps that we see in our like Okazaki fragments, uh, gap in, in between them. So there are enzymes which can scan the new regions and looking for the errors. So this is our DNA mismatch. This is new made DNA strand and this is the next and this is old DNA strand. So binding of DNA mismatch repair proteins. So then our mismatch repair protein system will come. It will bind to it, uh, which having this DNA mismatch. And then it will remove the newly synthesized DNA strand and repair with the help of DNA polymerase and ligase. So it will produce a new DNA strand here and it will put it up there. So that's the basics behind most of the DNA repair system is happening. So correction mechanism, so there could be also direct reversible of damage that is photo reactivation. So two thymines are connected together by UV light and excision repair, so removal of defective DNA. There are three distinct types um, are possible. That is base excision, uh, nucleotide excision and mismatch repair system. Right. So, so in the base excision method, there is a uracil is present uh, in our enzyme, in our DNA. The special enzyme will replace that defective base. Either by snipping out the defective base or cut the DNA strand, add fresh nucleotide and then ligate the gate. Or in the nucleotide excision, as same like before, but it will uh, look for varieties of damage and it will recover the large segments of DNA, not the small one, from 10 to 100 bases. And in the mismatch repair system, it will find the bulky alterations uh, of the DNA double helix. They're normally mismatched, like A is making with the G, A is making with the C, C is making with the T. So they will be removed, excised, and the DNA will be repaired. So let's check one by one each one that we have discovered. Uh, so there is a this DNA to the top strand here. This a damage was done. Yeah. So we what we'll do? We will remove this damaged region. And the DNA polymerase will come and will attach the new strand. And the DNA ligase will seal the nick. So this is the nick that is being produced. So this will be healed by the DNA ligase. So what the main simple step for the repairing of the DNA is, you remove the damaged DNA, then you resynthesize it, and then ligate. That's it. So we have to be considered from the sunlight that we are getting, uh, how the sunlight bathing or daily exposure so because our ozone lower is depleting and we can't control the global warming uh, but impact on the different skin tones uh, could lead to and there's environmental degradation is also happening so we need to be careful about that evolutions also acts on the mutation so if we do not have mutations then we would uh, be all the same yeah so any changes in the environment would be deleterious to all members so there would be no evolution so it's okay the mutations are happening but 
as as we can see with this recent covid uh, situation uh, it has abruptly changed the world and they're saying within the two or three weeks uh, the third wave of covid is also coming up so there was a news by aims famous guleria's doctor uh, dr guleria that we have the, the third delta delta covid virus is still coming to remove the population from the earth so it's already been in 28 uh, 28 cities but my personal feeling is that we india has faced the the harshest uh, of the two waves first wave was not so deleterious for india we have survived that very well but the second wave that came up it's just removed half of the population actually we don't know how much how many people have died so that's a uh, like evolution based on the bad way so we all had some effects of this uh, covid virus and then we are still facing some symptoms out of it um so let's see how things will be coming up so here the whale and human genome so we can see the whale and human they have almost most of the dna is, is similar uh, nothing is different but there's a t and c a and g because of these four nucleotides the whale is so big and we are so tiny so that's the analogy is showing that um, that the genomic sequence might be similar, but just due to the change of some amino acids, things could be different. So that was it about the DNA repair system. We will share this presentation with you now. So DNA replication was done, basics of molecular biology was done, PCR was done, right? DNA isolation was done. Okay, good. So, very well. Okay, now This will be too much if I start today. This is for the one month. Uh, if you are interested to go for one month uh, lecture. So I have all the notes about the translation, transcription. In detail with RNA synthesis and so on.
yeah so lack of prone system so basically uh, we're going to discuss the last topic that is gene expression um so this lack of prone system and trp operant system so this seems to be a bit complex for many students so i tried to make it as simple as possible in this slides so basically bacterial genes are often found in operons genes in an operon are transcribed as a group and have a single promoter so each operon contains regulatory dna sequences which act as a binding sites for regulatory proteins so that promote or inhibit transcription and regulatory proteins often bind to small molecules which can make the protein active or inactive by changing its ability to bind dna some operons are inducible meaning that they can be turned on by the presence of particular small molecule other are repressible meaning that they are on by default but can be turned off by a small molecule so we tend to think of bacteria as a simple but the simplest bacteria has a complex task when it comes to gene regulation so how gene regulation works in bacteria so here we can see in bacterium we have this bacterial chromosome yeah and this has operon and this operon there is a promoter region where rna polymerase binds right and then there is a gene 1 gene 2 and gene 3 so gene these genes that work together and this is your whole dna and these genes will further produce with the help of transcription your mrna and then after the translation it will produce protein 1 2 and 3 so that's how uh, a simple operon system works so basically what is operon is operon has a rna polymerase binding site and it will have all the genes for the from the dna perspective and which will help with the help of transcription and translation produce mrna and protein uh, respectively so there could be two system called lack operon system and trip operon system so we will discuss about them so first let's of all discuss the anatomy of an operon let's get the skeleton out of it so in the promoter region uh, your rna polymerase will add uh, once the promoter region rna polymerase is added to it then with the help of transcription your mrna will be produced from your G gene 1 2 and 3 so this is the promoter promoter region where dna uh, rna polymerase binds then most operons have other regulated dna sequence in addition to the promoter uh these sequences are binding sites for regulatory proteins that turn expressions of the operon that is up or down so some regulatory proteins are repressors that bind to the pieces of dna called operators so when bound to its operator a repressor reduces transcription so there is a op uh, operator here and towards this operator a repressor has been attached yeah so that no trans transcription is possible uh if it is attached this operator uh, if repressor is attached to the operator then no transcription is is possible then no mrna is made and also your polymerase dna polymerase will also not attach to the promoter site so and beyond that there is activator site beyond the operator site just beside the left so if it is bind then lots of transcription will have and the lots of mrna will be produced so so what we have discussed here is so far that there is a promoter region now uh, regulated dna sequence have um, which can, which has able to attach rna polymerase to it and make the reaction go up and then there is a operator on which your repressor will attach and no transcription will happen and then there is a activator yeah where activator binds and it makes the reaction very fast so activator promoter operator gene so these five components makes makes a total um, operon system 
So there is also sometimes your activator that is being attached could be off yeah, and no binding will happen. But if we add some molecules to the activator then it will bind to the target DNA. So that's also are possible one thing. Now they could be operon system could be inducible or repressible. So that means they could be off and they could be on by some molecules and the molecule is called an inducer and the operon is sent to be inducible. The molecule which induce this thing will be called as inducer and the operon system is called as inducible. For example, the LAC operon which is an inducible operon that encodes enzymes for metabolism of the sugar lactose and it turns on only when the sugar lactose is present and other preferred sugars are present in, are absent. So inducer in this case is the lactose a modified form of lactose. Yeah. So other operons are usually on but can be turned off by small molecules these are called as co-repressors and operon system will be called as repressible system. So in this example is your trip operon which is a repressible operon system that encodes enzyme for synthesis of the amino acid tryptophan. So some genes and operons are expressed all the time. So let's start with the lac operon system. So some terms, key points. So the lac operon system of E. coli, it contains genes involved in the lactose metabolism. The lactose that is being produced in our body uh, with the help of lactase enzyme being able to uh, convert it into glucose and galactose. So some people are also lactose tol uh, tolerant, intolerant. They cannot digest that, uh, that sugar. So for them, the milk is coming as a lactose free milk. So that's where this uh, mechanism is working. So it is expressed only when lactose is present and glucose is absent. So, so two regulatories turns the operon on and off system to lactose and glucose level. So the repressor and the catabolite activator protein. So there is a lac repressor which will stop the reaction and there is a cap which will activate the reaction. Catabolite activator protein. See? And the lac repressor which will act as a lactose sensor. It normally blocks the transcription of the operon system but stop acting as a repressor when lactose is present. If lactose is present, then lac, lac repressor will not work. Why? Because lac repressor senses that lactose is indirectly through the isomers of allolactase. So he knows that allolactose is coming, so it will not activate. And then catabolite activator protein act as a glucose sensor. It activates the transcription of operon, but only when glucose levels are low. Yeah. If glucose level are high, this cap will not work. So cap senses glucose indirectly through hunger signal molecule CMP. So here we can see that there is a cap site, there is an operator site and there is a promoter site. And there are three genes that is producing LAC, Z, Y and A. So these genes are transcribed as a single mRNA under the control of one promoter. So LAC Z encodes an enzyme that splits lactose into monosaccharides that can be fed into glycolysis. Then LAC Y encodes membrane embedded transporter that helps bring lactose into the cell. So in addition to the three genes, the LAC operon also contains a number of regulatory DNA sequences. And these are the regions of DNA to which particular regulatory proteins can bind controlling transcription of the operon. So this you have a cap site here which promoter RNA polymerase binding will be attached to it. You have a presser which will stop the RNA polymerase to be getting attached. 
and so on. So what will happen when there is no lactose? Yeah. When lactose is absent, the LAC repressor binds tightly to the operator. So the LAC repressor will tightly bind to the operator because it senses that there is no lactose is there. So its, its repressor will be activated and hence RNA polymerase cannot be attached to it and no transcription will happen. But on the other hand, if the lactose is present, so press, the allyl lactose will attach to the repressor. Yeah, allo lactose will attach to the repressor and then RNA polymerase will go further. It could be attached to the promoter and hence transcription is possible. And then CMP, how is it working? As, we, as I told, if there is low glucose, so because of the low glucose present, CAP will get to know that, uh, sorry, CMP will get to know about that. Uh, it will attach to the CAP and it will let it bind to the cap site and hence you will have high transcription. But if there is high glucose then CMP uh, will be not made and it will not attach to the cap and cap will not attach to the cap site. Hence you will your RNA polymerase will be attached but you will have low transcription. I will make these two slides I repeat again no lactose that means a repressor could attach to the operator with lactose a lactose will attach to the repressor so the presser can't attach operator so no lactose if it is attached no transcription rna polymerase can't be attached no transcription if it is absent from the operator rna polymerase could be attached hence could be transcribed if low glucose cmp will be produced attached to the cap and will attach to the cap site, hence high transcription. If it is high glucose, no CMP will be produced uh, to the cap and hence at the cap site, you will have a uh, very low transcription. Yeah. Just understand the concept of presence of no lactose and presence of um, lactose and presence of low glucose and presence of high glucose. How operator region and your cap side, this uh, activator region, they are working out. So when does the lac operon really turns on? So here we can see, we can make this put things all together, that when repressor is there, yeah, glucose is present, lactose is absent. So repressor will attach as glucose is present, high glucose is there, CMP will be not produced, so it will not uh, uh, operator. But as lactose is present, so is absent so allo lactose will be not there so repressor is active so no transcription so now we are combining the two conditions that we were discussing here together that is no lactose with high glucose with lactose with low lactose so all four conditions what if glucose is present lactose is absent so if lactose is present that means allo lactose could attach to the repressor hence transcription could happen but if glucose is present so cmp will be not produced so cap will not attach to the cap. So you will have a medium transcription. What if lactose is absent and glucose is absent? So if glucose is absent, you will have CMP. CMP will attach to the cap and cap site will be activated. But as lactose is absent, so allyl lactose will be absent and it will not attach to the repressor. And repressor is activated then, it will attach to the operator and no uh, transcription will happen even though cap site activator is there. So that's the uh, reason it will not happen. Another side, glucose absent and lactose present. So if lactose is present, allo lactose will attach to the repressor. Yeah, and then you will have the transcription. Also, glucose is absent, so CMP will be activated, cap will be activated, and it will attach to the cap site.
So this is the summary of lag operon responses. So this is the summary that we have just discussed uh, without with lactose plus minus lactose minus cap and repressor bind. Then without plus glucose plus lactose without cap without repressor low level transcription. No glucose, no lactose, cap binds, repressor binds, no transcription. Glucose is not there, uh, lactose is there, then cap binds, repressor not bind, then strong transcription. So that's the summary that we have just discussed in previous diagram. Yeah. Go through these all lectures again and uh, read them again because these concepts are sometimes very hard to understand at once. Yeah, why RNA is there, why RNA polyp is not attaching, why repressor is working, why lactose is there, why absent. So I can understand at the once if you are at the bachelor level these things might be a bit complicated. But uh, this is how this concept works. Yeah, Either glucose is absent just you have to remember lactose and glucose. If lactose is there, uh, present is absent that means allolactose lactose will not produce. So repressor is activated. So no transcription, no transcription. But glucose is absent, yeah. Then CMP is produced high and cap site will be activated. So transcription could happen. But as the repressor is there, so nothing could happen further. So glucose absent, lactose present, repressor will go out, cap site is activated, high transcription, and so on. So that was the summary of lag operon system. Now comes the sec uh, next part that is trip operon system which is found in E. coli bacteria. It's a group of genes that encode biosynthetic enzymes for the amino acids tryptophan. And the trip operon is expressed when the tryptophan levels are quite low and expressed when they are high. So trip operon is regulated by trip repressor when bound to the tryptophan and the trip repressor blocks the expression of the operon system. So here we have this promoter region, yeah, operator region of E. coli bacteria and it's producing five different genes, trip E, so from here A, B, C, D, E and then transcription they produces mRNA and then with translation produce uh, enzymes for the tryptophan biosynthesis, five different proteins. So the same way it will have the operator system trip or repressor on which your tryptophan will attach whenever there is a high tryptophan presence. Yeah, if tryptophan presence is high then your trip repressor will be active and hence you will have no transcription. So, but when your low tryptophan is present so trip repressor will be inactivated so transcription could be happen. So that's the main thing between trip repressor, it's, it was not as complicated as the uh, lack operon system. So that was it up from the lack operon system. I hope this was clear. Yeah, but yeah, I told this promoter region is the one on which your RNA polymerase is attached and let the transcription happen. Now, let's go to the next part. So this was not asked in this group, but I am just teaching you for your betterment. So always remember in the blotting technique, there is thing called snowdrop. 
एस फॉर सदर्न एन फॉर नदर्न डब्ल्यू फॉर वेस्टर्न एंड डी फॉर डी एन ए आर फॉर आर एन ए पी फॉर प्रोटीन सो सदर्न ब्लॉटिंग इज डन टू नो द अबाउट डी एन ए नदर्न इज डन फॉर टू गेट टू नो अबाउट आर एन ए एंड वेस्टर्न इज डन टू गेट टू नो अबाउट द प्रोटीन या सो ऑल दीज थिंग्स रिमेंबर दिस फॉर एवर इट विल रियली हेल्प यू सो वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट सदर्न ब्लॉटिंग नदर्न वेस्टर्न सदर्न वेस्टर्न नदर्न वेस्टर्न डॉट एंड जू ब्लॉटिंग so southern blotting is is actually detect the dna fragments uh, that have been size fraction by the gel electrophoresis and this technique was invented in 1975 by em southern so in this technique we exploit the property of radio label probe with a single stranded dna if we want to detect the presence of specific sequence in our mixed dna sample then we will accordingly design the probe which will have complementary sequence to our target sequence so basically in this procedure you have your um, dna run over the gel right these nucleic acids and these are the radioactively labeled markers with specific sizes and this is electrophoretic gel yeah so electrophoresis perform uh, your 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 dna will move along the along the gel according to the molecular sizes then you transfer this gel over the nitrocellulose membrane and then you get the all your gel part your your dna getting transfer over the nitrocellulose membrane and then what you do is you blot them with the help of your radioactive label nucleic acid that what you are looking for and then once you are done in this sealed container you can check them these hybridized nucleic acids that are working for you so there could be many applications it could help to determine um yeah genetic patterns uh, gene mapping uh to detect certain cancers and genetic diseases paternity testing sex determination species exclusion so all these are possible from the southern blotting so now i will switch to uh, my voice will be not coming so in how southern blotting is done in the lab experimentally yeah it will explain all the experiments experimentally now so there will be text coming up just go through that
so that was about dna the same way uh, rna is possible is just we have to take care that rna's enzyme is not present so single stranded rna by ribonucleus we have to avoid this degradation and also we have to add dithyl pyrocarbonate for the northern blotting that is a dpc which inhibits ribonuclease activity also baking at high temperature destroys your ribonuclease activity so the same steps you isolate from several biological samples your rna then you separate according to size on the agrose gel then gel is blotted on the nanol membrane and then afterwards you hybridize with the label probe then you remove the unwanted probe then you check whether x ray fill so let's see how this is done um your northern blotting
okay so this is the technique that we use for northern transfer now western blotting is a technique for basically for protein in which we separate our protein uh, on the basis of its size so the same way we run it over the sds page that is sodium dodecyl sulfide polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis we transfer to the nitrocellulose membrane then we prove them with the primary antibody and secondary antibody and then check with the help of scamoluminescent substrate under the light so here we having this nitrocellulose membrane attached with the different proteins to that we add primary antibody and then secondary antibody and then afterwards uh, we can check them under the blue band indicating of the proteins yeah so let's check how this uh, western blotting is done practically from a lab perspective in this video you will learn how to perform a western blot a western blot can be used to identify specific proteins in a sample and provide information about the protein size and relative abundance in the sample first fill a tray with blotting buffer you'll be using this buffer to equilibrate your gel prior to starting the western blot next remove the gel from the gel cassette using the opening key line up the arrows on the opening lever with the four arrows on the cassette to open the cassette. After trimming the top and bottom of the gel with a straight edge, equilibrate the gel in the tray with blotting buffer for 15 minutes on a rocking platform. Pre-soak fiber pads in blotting buffer so that they are thoroughly soaked. To make a blotting sandwich, obtain a container large enough to fit the gel holder and add enough blotting buffer until the container is filled approximately one centimeter deep. Place the gel holder cassette in the container with the black side down and immersed in the buffer and the white side up and out of the buffer. Lay one fiber pad flat on the black plastic. Next, wet a piece of blotting paper and place it on top of the pad. Be careful to avoid any bubbles between the pad and the paper and make certain the buffer covers the paper. Take the gel and carefully place it squarely onto the blotting paper. Again, being careful to avoid any bubbles between the gel and the blotting paper. Next, you will be applying a piece of nitrocellulose membrane. Remove the protective sheet from the membrane and wet the membrane with blotting buffer. Carefully place the membrane squarely on the gel. Avoid moving the membrane once placed on the gel as proteins will begin to blot immediately. Using a roller, remove any air bubbles between the gel and the membrane. Place a second sheet of wet blotting paper on top of the nitrocellulose membrane. Place a second wet fiber pad on top of the blotting paper. Fold the clear plastic side of the gel holder over the sandwich and clamp it to the black plastic side by sliding over the white clip. This tight fit will squeeze the sandwich together. Insert the gel holder into the inner module. 
make certain that the black side of the gel holder is next to the black side of the module. Place the inner module into the electrophoresis chamber. Add a frozen cooling unit and fill the chamber with blotting buffer to the level of the white clip on the gel holder. Place the lid on the electrophoresis chamber. Connect the electrical leads to the power supply, making sure the connections are correct, red to red and black to black. Turn on the power supply and run the blot at 20 volts. If a timer is available, set it for two and a half hours. When the run is complete, turn off the power supply and disassemble the electrophoresis chamber and remove the inner module. Open the module and place it in a container filled with blotting buffer with the black side down. Starting with the first fiber pad, remove each layer until you reach the nitrocellulose membrane. As you remove the membrane, note that the proteins have been transferred from the gel to the membrane. Note that the kaleidoscope pre-stain standards have been transferred and can be seen on both sides of the membrane. You can also see that there are no longer any proteins on the gel. Immerse the membrane in 25 milliliters of blocking solution and incubate it for 15 minutes at room temperature on a rocking platform. Pour off the blocking solution. Add 10 milliliters of primary antibody. Incubate for 10 to 20 minutes on a rocking platform. The platform should be set at a faster setting to ensure constant coverage of the membrane. Pour off the primary antibody. Rinse the membrane quickly in 50 milliliters of wash buffer and then discard the wash buffer. Add another 50 milliliters of wash buffer to the membrane and let it wash for three minutes on the rocking platform at a medium speed setting. Discard the wash buffer. Add 10 milliliters of secondary antibody and incubate the membrane for 5 to 15 minutes on the rocking platform at a fast speed. Pour off the secondary antibody. Rinse the membrane quickly in 50 milliliters of wash buffer and discard the wash buffer. Add an additional 50 milliliters of wash buffer and wash the membrane for three minutes on the rocking platform on a medium speed setting.
Discard the wash buffer. Add 10 milliliters of substrate. Incubate the membrane with the substrate for 10 to 30 minutes with either manual shaking or on a rocking platform. Watch for the color development. Once the colors have developed, rinse the membrane twice with distilled water and blot dry with the paper towel. Air dry for 3 to 60 minutes and then cover in plastic wrap for storage. So very nicely, precisely shown all the blots being come up, coming up with the help of your blotting technique and we have differentiate your proteins also. Then you can do this technique in combination of southern and western to find out the DNA binding proteins or RNA binding proteins in the northern western. In the dot blotting, it is modified version of the western blotting uh, which is done to identify and analyze uh, uh, various protein of interest. So dot blot methodology different from traditional western blot technolo technology by not separation the uh, electrophoresis. And the last not the least is a zoo blotting in which there is a region called non coding regions which does not code and there is a coding region. And then you check into different species that is rat, rat cow, dog, human and then you can explain that which are the coding regions and which are the non coding regions. So that was it from the perspective of blotting techniques.